whose work I've long admired and what better I've been able to use in my own papers and classrooms. For years, Professor Jane Burbank, a specialist of law awe and ideas in the Russian Empire, uh, in the Russian and Soviet empires, and for Professor Fred Cooper, a historian of labor in East and West Africa during the colonial period and decolonization, used to teach a co used to co-teach a seminar on empires and world history at New York University. And graduate students from across New York and beyond uh, used to flock to take this course. And there was good reason. Professors Burbank and Cooper are masters of taking those small personal stories, peasants in Imperial Russia, filing petitions in civil court or dock workers in Mombasa and using them to examine deceptively, deceptively simple but fundamental human questions, such as how do people actually use and uphold the state? And how do we think about ourselves in relation to others? Perhaps they can do this so skillfully because they both look far beyond the discipline of history for inspiration, ideas, and collaborators. Nevertheless, I'd venture to say that their most enduring and important collaborative work has been together. Over 10 years ago, professors Burbank and Cooper published Empires in World History. It begins with the observation that for much of recorded human history, people across the world uh, lived in empires of various forms and kinds. Imperial subjects, unlike national citizens, were different, and thus empires, often coercively and hierarchically, governed them differently. Empires in World History thus studies how empires ruled different people across wide spaces for long periods of time. In particular, they examine how empires used local intermediaries, adapted the strategies of their predecessors or competitors um, to rule imperial that their sorry adapted the strategies that their predecessors or competitors had used to rule imperial subjects in the past and learned new ways of governing by studying conflict ridden borderlands. Today, they are here to present another collaborative project, Post Imperial Possibilities Eurasia, Eurafrica, and Afroasia which examines how people confronting the dissolution of European empires in the 20th century imagined new post-imperial polities that, like empires and unlike nation states, understood people as different and uh, governed them with difference in mind, but unlike empires, ideally aspired to remedy rather than institutionalize inequality. So without any further delay, let me give you Professors Burbank and Cooper. Well, thank you very much, Nicole, for this introduction. And it's a pleasure for us both to be back here at the European University Institute. Been here several times in the past. This time our uh, hosts are uh, the Max Weber program and Juho Harkonnen, very, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, and uh, Veselina, Spira, Veselina Spiridonova for making many arrangements. And then also Glenda Sluga, who uh, was very much responsible for um, our association with the Toynbee Foundation. And you'll hear a little bit about Toynbee today. So, Poles, Blocks, Worlds, and Civilizations, Geopolitics Beyond the State. <clears throat> Speaking in an international forum, seven months after his invasion of Ukraine, Vladimir Putin proclaimed his commitment to a multipolar world. The collapse of the Soviet Union had upset the equilibrium of the geopolitical forces, he averred. The West had declared itself the victorious leader of a unipolar world, but Russia was standing up to this threat by means of a politics based on large spaces. Large spaces where neighbors share complementary economic and social systems, resources, and infrastructure. The great space of Eurasia could become integrated, cooperative, self-sufficient, and powerful if left on its own. Instead, the West was intent on splitting Eurasia and turning it into a zone of block confrontation. Here's a view one view of Eurasian world. Putin's speech castigated, castigated uh, the West for denying the sovereignty of countries and peoples, 
their identity and uniqueness and trampling upon other states' interests. The very actions that Russia's army was carrying on at the time in Ukraine. Our focus today is not on Putin's hypocrisy, but upon the kind of thinking about units of political action that Putin shared with many others across centuries. Putin's vision of a Eurasian polity in a world divided into blocks drew on theories developed by Russian exiles after the collapse of the Tsarist Empire in 1917, and then revived in new versions after a second imperial collapse in 1991. Russia's Eurasianists at the beginning and the end of the 20th century shared two attitudes, a rancorous antipathy to what they regarded as the false universalism promoted by Western civilization, and a claim that the fundamental units of belonging and antagonism were not nation states, but much larger units, each associated with a region, a great space, defined by its culture, or some would say civilization. If such geopolitical ideas lie behind Putin's assault on Ukraine, Ukrainians were thinking differently. Their determined mobilization to preserve their 30-year-old state took Putin and much of the rest of the world by surprise. The ability of Ukraine to continue the struggle reflected both the will of the people of a newly independent state to defend themselves and support for their effort coming from Putin's hated West. The stakes for nearby states are high for Putin has denied that former members of the Soviet bloc have a right to join alliances as they see fit. This tension between a world of sovereign states, most of them founded since 1945, but some since 1989, and the concentration of military and economic might in great powers is central to world politics today. Putin's attempt to reconstitute Russian empire has produced what he wanted to prevent. The Western bloc now has a coherence it seemed to be losing. The question we pose is, can we think beyond the categories attacked and defended in the current conflict while recognizing their salience and historical depth? Thinking of the world as divided into blocks was not unique to Russian Eurasianists. In the heyday of an imperial world, an imperial world dominated by rival powers, theorists contemplated new spatial configurations of political affili affiliation. In 1904, Halford Mackinder's influential article, The Geographical Pivot of History, envisioned a Central Asian space as the main counter to the empires constructed by Britain, France, and other Western European states. Mackinder considered what he called Eurasia with a hyphen to be the pivot of geopolitics and the focus of cont contestation between opposing blocs for global mastery. Significant for both Mackinder and early Eurasianists was the distinction between a land-based bloc and a sea-based one. Russian Eurasianists emphasized the possibilities of a great continental economy at a time when Britain's maritime sphere enveloped most of the world. Dividing the world into large blocks persisted in political theory throughout the 20th century, even as the contours of the categories and their names changed. After the Second World War, the world word bloc was applied to the communist countries of Eastern Europe, first by critics in the West, later appropriated inside the bloc itself. In the 1950s, the third world acquired political salience as a position between the communist and free world blocs. After the dismemberment of the Soviet Union, alongside declarations of the end of history, Samuel Huntington predicted a clash of civilizations, including an irreconcilable divide between an Islamic world 
and the Western world. These examples, however diverse their contexts, su suggest that the units of civilizational affinity and political action have been conceived as larger than nationally defined states and empires. Arnold Toynbee, probably the most widely read world historian of the 20th century, consistently used the concept of civilization from ancient times to his own in the plural. He did not think of civilizations as fixed and bounded entities moving through time. Civilizations, including that of Western Europe, could decay as well as rise, and they interacted with each other. In the aftermath of World War I, Toynbee was favorable toward the self-determination of peoples, but skeptical of nationalism. He looked toward federative structures wider than the political atom of the nation state, national state. At that time, he had a soft spot for British Empire, which he saw as promoting interaction among peoples. Nationality and liberal internationalism were for him compatible but both the Leninist version of self-determination and pan-Islamic ideas about a supranational world order were dangerous. A world war later, and more attuned to the repressive actions of European empires, Toynbee became more critical of imperialism. In his view, colonial empire was not evidence of civilizational superiority, but a harbinger of decline. What he disliked above all was any claim to being the only civilization in the world, a position that earned him fierce attacks from apologists for British empire. Toynbee's other enemy was the belligerent local state, the nation state in today's terms. In a book on Hellenism, which Toynbee conceived in 1914, but did not complete until 1959, he examined Hellenism's significance for Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, but he also excoriated, quote, the Hellenic, Hellenic worship of idolized local states. He ended his book as follows. The modern world much, must exercise this demon, the local state, resolutely, is it, if it is to save itself from meeting with its Hellenic predecessor's fate. Our point is not to make Toynbee into a prophet of anti-colonialism or anti-nationalism, but to appreciate his questioning of established structures in world politics. Toynbee was not confined by the binary of empire nation and nation state. In this talk, we consider some other ways in which political thinkers and political activists approached questions of affinity and collective action in a world that is connected and unequal. So first, we're going to go back in time to look at some ways, very briefly, in which powerful polities imagined themselves from ancient times onward, whether as universal empires with no equivalents or as great powers competing with each other, or as empires defined by the notion of a European civilization, managers of an uncivilized world whose values did not have to be respected. We then will turn to three 20th century plans to replace empire with broad transcontinental projects, Eurasia, Africa, and Afro-Asia. We will close with some references reflections about contemporary framing of world politics and their uses and dangers. So from empire worlds to a world of empires, the concept that poles, blocks, worlds, and multiple civilizations would not be familiar in ancient Rome and ancient China. Both empires were universalizing and they each could imagine themselves as leaders of the world. Initially, the Roman Empire was polytheistic. The gods of its various conquered peoples could be worshiped along with Roman ones. But Rome's later adoption of Christianity with its radical exclusion of other people's gods facilitated a new kind of universalism based on the enticing integration of monotheism 
into imperial power. But this reconfiguration also opened the door to rival claimants to be God's voice on earth. The Eastern Roman Empire evolved its own style of Christian rule, a collaboration of ruler with ecclesiastical authority, while in the West, the papacy attempted to sustain authority over multiple configurations on formerly Roman spaces. The breakup of the Roman Empire led both to centuries of conflict among kings, lords, and other local powers, and to attempts to reconfigure power, political and religious, on a larger scale. The Holy Roman Empire, which lasted nearly a millennium, was partway between an empire, it had an emperor, and a block of monarchies that intermittently acknowledged a higher power and a layered form of sovereignty. As Rome shattered politically and culturally, in China, dynasties rose and fell, but each kept reinstating the ideal of constituting a singular polity on an imperial scale. Islamic empires had to confront other powers and other faiths from the start, although the early caliphates claimed to consolidate political and religious authority, the Ummah, the community of Muslims, only co coincided with the polity for short periods. Neither the Umayyad nor the Ab Abbasid Caliphate could eliminate rival Islamic polities, and the Caliphates drew in many non-Muslims as they expanded their domain domains. In contrast to proselytizing Christians who never gave up on universality, Islamic theory divided the world into Dar, es, al, Dar al Islam, the regions under Islamic law, and Dar al Harb, the land of war, that is, non Islamic lands. Islamic rulers, like Christian ones, were confronted with multiple schisms, as well as by tensions between Ummah and polity. The fragmentation of the post Roman world meant that all aspirants to greater power in the region had to confront the ambitions of others. But a formidable effort at putting the world together again into a, under a single ruler took shape in 13th century Eurasia. The Mongol empires of Chinggis Khan and his successors aspired to universality, but not to uniformity. Mongol rulers sheltered Muslims, Buddhists, Christians, Jews, Taoists, shamanists, and believers in many other cults. For the Mongols, diversity was both normal and a usable asset. Ruling over diverse societies allowed them to take in the particular skills of people they conquered. As Mongol power receded, the Ottoman Empire both lodged itself firmly in the formerly Byzantine space and managed to incorporate highly differentiated populations. After the conquest of Mecca in 1517, the Ottomans claimed the status of both empire headed by a sultan and caliphate. The empire contained partially self-administered but loyal non-Muslim groups. The most powerful of the Western European empires in conflict with the Ottomans, that of the Habsburgs, defined itself against religious others at that time, exporting, expelling Muslims and Jews from Spain and fighting Protestants in territories that the dynasty claimed. That Christen, Christendom was both a world unto itself but divided internally can be seen in the Treaty of Tordesillas of 1494. Sponsored by the Pope, it divided the world into Portuguese and Spanish spheres with a line that encircled the world, now a globe. The, this attempt at imperial coordination on a global scale was not respected by the agreeing parties, let alone by other empires. The reconfiguration of world power around the globe in the next centuries was shaped by multiple empires as they competed, connected, and reimagined each other. The expanding Christian powers self-consciously distinguished themselves from various others while treating local sovereigns in distant regions with mixtures of aggression, disdain, and caution. 
turning to the 19th century. To what extent did the great divergences of the late 18th and 19th centuries harden prejudice and asymmetrical power relations into more sharply demarcated worlds? Shamil Aydin has argued that a Muslim world looked at from both sides is a 19th century construct. As he puts it, Muslims did not imagine belonging to a global polity until the peak of European hegemony in the late 19th century. Nor did Europeans imagine themselves encountering a unified Muslim world until their takeover of much of the world's, the Europeans takeover of much of the world's surface confronted them with the possibility of challenges on a similarly large scale. In the 19th century, civilization became more of a central category used by European, to, European societies to define themselves, Osterhamel's formulation. This self-representation as the civilized world was spurred both by overseas colonization and a growing consciousness that the two other major empires, Ottoman and Chinese, were not the threat they once had been. Civilizational distinctions became sharper, but that did not lessen the rivalry among Western European empires. The aspiration to make empire on Rome's scale was not a distant memory in Europe at this time. Napoleon had aspired to be the emperor, not just of France, but of Europe. His failure led the powers who defeated him to coordinate their defense of an imperial world. The Congress of Vienna of 1815 was the first of such of a series of conclaves of European elites intending to shape a rule-bound order that was specifically European. Later in the century, European leaders collaborated to define rules of warfare that would limit war's brutality, but those rules did not apply to colonial conquest overseas. The Berlin Conferences of 1878 on the Balkans, 1884-85 on Africa, were attempts to avoid inter-empire conflict. By setting rules for how to con con conduct conquest and how an ethically correct colonization should proceed by abolishing slavery, for example, the attempt at regulating imperialism was a major step in defining Europe as an entity and a civilization. This is the world of empires in 1900. This process was accompanied by eff efforts of lawyers to configure what became known as international law, based on a distinction between civilized and uncivilized territories. International law would integrate, regulate interaction among the civilized. Uncivilized people would be the objects, not the subjects of administration by the civilized. The effects at collaboration made by a small number of powers, each capable of mobilizing resources beyond national territory and forming alliances with great and small powers, did not extinguish imperial rivalries. A world ordered by empires was inherently unstable and exploded in the catastrophe of World War I. Turning to the 20th century, the idea of self determination was articulated after the war in Wilsonian and Leninist variations. But only the losing empires were broken up and those into units that were far from the ideal of a homogeneous polity. Multiple possibilities of political space were in play after the war. As Jonathan Ritson puts it, quote, how people re-envision re new political worlds in terms of empire, caliphate, mandate, emirate, kingdom, republic, religious network, tribe, was clearly not according to fixed or unchanging ethno-nationality identities and preferences. A new configuration appeared, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, formerly a federation of republics, each representing a nationality. The League of Nations, as well as the array of colonies, mandates, and protectorates, implied a continued de 
division of the post-war world as seen from Europe or North America along a civilized, uncivilized axis, even as other divisions emerged, both inside Europe and abroad, fascist versus democratic regions, regimes, capitalist versus communist economies, activists in the colonies tried to form their own bloc through, for example, the League Against Imperialism, founded in 1927, and via Pan-African, Pan-Arab, or other space-crossing organizations. Their attempts at unity were, like those of the rival imperial powers, cross-cut by the tensions that empires had created. A politics of reform within each imperial unit versus an anti-imperialist front. Communists versus non-communists. Japan's assertion of an anti-European imperialism versus the claims of victims of Japanese imperialism. Nationalists in each territory versus pan-movements, federalists, and global anti-imperialists. It was in this context that Richard von Kodenhoef Kalergi in 1923 set out his idea of a world divided into five blocks, pan-Europe, pan-Africa, pan-Europe, pan pan-America, Russian Empire, British Empire, and East Asia. Two were defined as empires and others spatially. Pan-Europe was really Eurafrica. Kudenhove imagined that European empires, instead of competing for African resources, could cooperate in the exploitation of the continent. He wanted to transform a dangerous world of rival states into one in which blocs would federate themselves. He envisioned a vaguely aristocratic pan-European elite running pan-Europa. His writing is thought to have influenced the process of European integration many years later. Among the schemes for reconfiguring politics to reduce the conflict among empires, while acknowledging connections among people that nationalism was unable to address, were three transcontinental projects that began in the 1920s and would reappear in new guises throughout the century. Now we turn to the topic of our book, Post-Imperial Possibilities, Eurasia, Eurafrica, Afro-Asia. So I will begin with Eurasia. In the turbulent 1920s, as I mentioned earlier, emigres who had fled the re revolutionary wars in Russia developed a project for Eurasia on principles diametrically opposed to those of Kudenhof Kalergi's Pan-Europa. Eurasia was an anti-imperial project aimed directly against European empires. Euro against European culture and against Europeans' arrogant and false universalism. The founders of what became the Eurasianist theory were Prince Nik Nikolai Trubetskoy and Pyotr Peter Savitsky, an innovative geologist. In 1920, Trubetskoy published a radical critique of Eurocentrism, entitled a book, a small book entitled Europe and humanity, Europe and humanity, two separate categories. The Romano-Germans in Trubetskoy's terms were fake universalists intent on imposing their egocentric ideology, a product of their particular history on the world. Demanding adherence to European values and forcing the rest of the world to catch up with European technology, in Trubitskoy's version, would only cut off half Europeanized elites from their compatriots and exhaust the energies of the divided society. In 1921, Trubitskoy, Savitsky, and other Russian emigres produced the first Eurasianist manu manifesto, the title was Exodus to the East. The 
In this manifesto, the Eurasianist, early Eurasianist argued that Russia should break with its European fascinations and reorient its spiritual vector toward its authentic transcontinental location and its multicultural past. Peter the Great's reforms had rotted the souls of Russia's elites for two centuries, they insisted. Lenin's communism was another pernicious European import, but a new Euro Eurasianist Russia was possible if Russia's intellectuals could recognize their roots in the shared and mixed histories of Turkic, Mongol, Finno-Ugric, Slavic, and Asian people. They should relinquish the goal of a secular state, return to uncorrupted orthodoxy, respect the traditional religions of Eurasia's many peoples. These mystical affirmations would become tenacious elements in the Eurasian repertoire. Savitsky bulked up the culturalist argument for Eurasia with a physical foundation. Pivot to the East, the title of one of Savitsky's articles in the 1920s echoed Mackinder. Preoccupied by what he called geopolitics, he used the term at the time, Savitsky took up Mackinder's distinction between oceanic and continental powers. Russia should focus on developing an intracontinental economy across Eurasia, exploiting its resources and products. Trubetsky, Trubetskoy, sorry, Trubetskoy buttressed Eurasianism with linguistic evidence for an Eastern imprint on Slavic culture and with a revisionist history that highlighted the contributions of Chinggis Khan and the Mongols to Russia's emergence as a transcontinental state. The conquest of the Caucasus, Turkestan and Siberia under the Tsars, the annexation of Crimea under Catherine the Great, these were all steps on the ways to recovering Chinggis Khan's empire. Trubetskoy was an ardent critic of nationalism and self-determination. A healthy political entity was built on the multiplicity of the cultures of his peoples, those people living in the bottom story of the political building and coordinated by a great leader. The leader, in turn, would be advised by intellectuals in the top story, where they would generate policies acceptable to all members of the edifice. Ambitious people from all groups, he argued, would naturally want to join the refining culture of the top story. In 1927, Trubetskoy denounced Ukrainian nationalism as yet another destructive European import. Ukrainian, he writes, was a distinctive expression of all Russian culture. Russian culture, in turn, was part of a rainbow of multi-ethnic Eurasia. For Eurasianists in the 1920s, political collectivity was not reserved for those who think and speak alike. Instead, people could find satisfaction within a large geophysical unit where over time, peoples had interacted to produce overlapping civilizational conditions and where unlikeness was both recognized and celebrated. The Eurasianist circle in Europe broke up in the late 1920s, fractured by disagreements and undermined by the Soviet secret police. But Eurasianism survived to be revived again during another imperial collapse. So now we will turn to two trans, the other two transcontinental projects and here Fred takes over the lecture. Ideas of uniting Europe to control Africa and of uniting the colonial world against Europe, both set out in the 1920s, appeared in radically new guises in the 1940s and 1950s. Such African leaders as Sangor and Krumah and Nasser, and Asian leaders like Sukarno and Nehru, realized that territorial independence would separate African or Asian people from each other, as well as from a colonizing power. They doubted that the nation state was a sufficient response 
to the enduring effects of colonial empire. Your Africa was a proposition to transform a colonial relationship rather than escape from it. Leaders from both French Africa and European France saw something in your Africa. The goals of advocates of your Africa in, the, in French Africa in the late 1940s and 1950s overlapped with leaders in France who sought integration with other states of Europe without giving up France's overseas territories. The inhabitants of French Africa had acquired the qualities of the French citizen in 1946, and African representatives were using their position in the French legislature, even as a small minority, to make claims for social and economic, as well as political equality, among all French citizens. Aware of negotiations beginning in 1948 of France with potential European partners in some sort of European community, French African leaders insisted that they have a voice in whatever your African institutions were created. Advocates of Afro-Asia, in contrast, sought to break with just such connections, reminiscent as they were of European dominance. They wanted instead to foster cooperation among former colonies to contest the power of their former colonizers, as well as that of the US and the USSR. Advocates of Afro, Afro Asian unity drew on pre war mobilizations against imperialism. But after the independence of India in 1947 and of Indonesia in 1949, leaders from several Asian countries took the lead in forging cooperation among these new states and decided to include Africa as well. The upshot was the Afro-Asian Conference held in Bandung, Indonesia in 1955, sponsored by Sukarno and attended by such luminaries as Nasser, Nehru, and China's Zhu Enlai. A series of movements followed in the wake of Bandung, including the Afro-Asian People's Solidarity Organization founded in Cairo in 1957 and the non-aligned movement founded in 1961 in which Yugoslavia joined states from Africa and Asia. The non-aligned movement directly addressed the relationship between two great transformations of global history in the middle of the 20th century, the Cold War and decolonization. It became the organizational vanguard out of growing, out of what, growing into what intellectuals and advocates dubbed the third world. Both your Africa and Afro-Asia, like Eurasia, entail rethinking the nature of political connection. Your Africa not only crossed the continental divide, but the racial divide between colonizer and colonized. It took advantage of the colonizing powers need to re-legitimize re itself in a changing global context, to refashion what one of your Africa's strongest advocates, Leopold Sangor, called vertical solidarity. That is Africa's relationship to France. Sangor believed that if citizens of French Africa could unite among themselves, what he called horizontal solidarity, they could bring pressure within your African institutions to redistribute resources to reduce the extreme inequality that the colonial situation had produced. Afro-Asia, in contrast, was premised on horizontal solidarity on a global scale. It was not altogether clear how ex-colonial states would be tied together institutionally, and it accepted that the post-imperial political order would be based on national states. Its goal was to combat the remnants of imperialism, guarantee the sovereignty of new and possibly fragile states, and redistribute resources to enable economic development. Your Africa received strong support in French Africa from the late 1940s to the late 1950s. Afro-Asia's heyday was the mid-1950s to the late 1970s. The Eurafrican project seemed realizable in 1956, when the French government made the inclusion of its African territories a condition for its participating in the European economic community that was then under negotiation. Beset by demands for social and economic equality coming out of Africa, France hoped to diffuse some of its costs to its European partners while granting more internal autonomy to African governments in their respective territories. But by 1957, it became clear that France's would-be European partners would not accept the burdens of ex-empire. Eager for European economic integration, France backed away from its Euro-African position. The European economic community would indeed be European. For elites in Sub-Saharan French Africa, 
This move lessened the attraction of a continued French relationship and tipped the balance toward negotiating independence, which was achieved in 1960. Algeria, site of a bitter war of liberation, won its independence in 1962 and used its sovereignty both to negotiate with limited success, a relationship with the European economic community, and to assert its leadership of an Afro-Asian movement set against the imperialist powers. Both your Africa and Afro-Asia confronted two major obstacles, the opposition of wealthy states to redistributing their resources and the vested interests that elites in decolonizing states acquired in the constituencies they were riding to power. Colonialism had constituted a shared target for criticism and mobilization, and by the 1960s, anti-colonial movements had succeeded in casting it out of the world's repertoire of legitimate political forms. But the process of decolonization sent ex-colonial states off in different direct, on different trajectories. Elites in each state had an interest in vertical relationships with the richer states of the first world or the anti-capitalist states of the second world. Multinational corporations and financial institutions had something to offer to cooperative third world elites, if not the populations they claimed to represent. Was the third world, to use a phrase proposed by a French demographer in 1952 and adopted by activists, in any political sense a world? Radical leaders inspired by the Afro-Asian movement tried to create wider unity by joining up with Latin American leftists in the Tricontinental Conference first held in Havana in 1966. But to many heads of state and recently independent countries, the radicalism of the Tricontinental Conference was more of a threat than a promise. A more reformist effort focused on the United Nations succeeded in bringing together leaders of states from Asia, Africa, and Latin America as the Group of 77, which kept that name even as its membership grew to 120 states. Member states ran the gamut from left to right, democracy to dictatorship, but they agreed on demands for a new international economic order, given the stamp of approval of the United Nations in 1974. The new international economic order's agenda called for national sovereignty over natural resources, reining in multinational corporations, altering trade regulations in favor of third world states, and augmenting foreign aid. In short, a global redistribution both of resources and of economic power. The Group of 77 was caught in the dilemma of the three world condition. It was opposed by the first world, which denied its premises as well as its specific demands, and got little support from the second communist world, which had its own ideas for reordering the world. What brought the group together was economic sovereignty, not a shared vision of a new social order. The rejection of the NIEO by 1981 marked the end of a phase of, of what uh, Adam Gadachu has termed world-making the efforts on the part of leaders of anti-colonial movements, not just to gain admission to a world of sovereign states, but to change the nature of that world. But efforts at world making, or world remaking we might say, continue in our times. A coalition of states similar to the group of 77 surfaced at the climate conference of 2022, demanding reparations for the damages done to their environments by industrialized states and help to meet the challenges of climate change. Another group of states, starting with Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, calling themselves BRICS, are trying to expand their membership to constitute themselves as a bloc, challenging the Western version of capitalism. They are a strange combination of bedfellows, oil exporting and consuming states, dictatorships and democracies, as much as was the group of 77, and their capacity to act coherently remains to be seen. Sovereignty had given the elites of former colonial of former colonies, platforms in the UN and elsewhere to make claims. But a national order of things has not enabled formerly colonized states to achieve one of the primary objectives of practically all anti-colonial movements, to reduce inequality between different parts of the world. A recent study by leading economists concludes, quote, global inequalities seem to be as great today as they were at the peak of Western imperialism in the early 20th century, end quote. The nation state system not only proved its incapacity to eliminate global inequality, it has also failed to stop violations of recognized sovereignty. 
by the U.S. in Iraq in 2003, by Russia in Ukraine in 2022. Global politics had been reconfigured by, a, by this time by a second round of decolonization begun in 1989-91, as former members of the Soviet bloc escaped from communist overrule and leaders of the republics of the USSR dismantled the federal polity into, into independent states. The process took place relatively peacefully with notable exceptions in former Yugoslavia and Chechnya. This is also the moment when Western political scientists declared the end of history, when three worlds seemed to be compressed into one. What everyone missed or did not want to remember is the capacity of defeated empires for comebacks. As the USSR was losing its grip, Eurasianism, along with other challenges to Soviet ideology, emerged once again as an alternative to communist empire and capitalist imperialism. To discontented elites on post-Soviet space, Eurasianism offered a foundation for the revival of the, of the former multinational state, an explanation for Russia's reduced stature in global affairs, and a recipe for revitalization of Russian power. In the late 1980s, neo-Eurasianists found the guru in, in Liev Gumilyov, an outcast academic whose stints in the gulag had connected him with, with Peter Savitsky. Gumilyev's 1989 masterwork, Ethnogenesis and the Biosphere of the Earth, turned Trubetskoy's vision of ethnic diversity into an eccentric theory of the rise and fall of distinct ethnic groups. World history from ancient times into the future was driven by cosmically inspired individuals who lead ethnic groups into competing super ethnic formations. After 1991, Eurasianism took two intertwined paths on the space of the former Soviet Union. In 1994, Nursultan Nazarbayev, the president of Kazakhstan, called on leaders of the former republics to unite in a Eurasian Union. His plan, modeled on the European Union, was based on a power and economic sharing arrangement with the Russian Federation. Nazarbayev's pragmatic approach to layered sovereignty and to re remedying the economic imbalance between Russia and the Central Asian countries echoes Sangor's proposal for Eurafrica. However, there was little support for Nazarbayev's idea in the 1990s, although, although a limited version, the Eurasian Economic Union with five members, was put into operation in 2015. By, the, by that time, Eurasianism had acquired enthusiasts among Russian intellectuals, the most vociferous and influential of whom was and is Alexander Dugin. Dugin's presses republished Trubetskoy and Savitsky. Savitsky's term geopolitics appeared twice in the title of Dugin's mammoth and much used textbook published in 1997, Foundations of Geopolitics, the Geopolitical Future of Russia. This volume, sponsored by Russia's Military Academy, transformed Trubetskoy's plea for a revolution in consciousness into a demand for Russian power in the world. Dugan followed Mackinder's distinction between land and sea and tweaked Carl Schmitt's planetary confrontation between East and West into a planetary duel between Atlantic USA and Russia Eurasia. Those were his words. Dugan turned the anti-imperialism of the early Eurasianists into an explicit assertion of empire as the appropriate form of power. Dugan rejected the very notion of nation state, which he sneeringly called the state nation. Russian's fate, the, Ru Russian's fate depended on facing geopolitical reality and building a new empire. The new empire, quote, must be Eurasian, span a great continent, and in the future, the world, end quote. Dugan is a master of both neologism and effective turnabouts of Western vocabulary. He deploys blocks, poles, civilizations, and worlds, as well as vectors, arrows, and circles of power in his maps. His voluminous publications and his steamy website have reached the hearts and minds of many in the Russian elite over the past 15 years. He has repeatedly insisted that control of Ukraine is, his words, an absolute imperative of Russian geopolitics. He cheered the annexation of Crimea as a step toward Russia's recovery as a great sovereign power in a multipolar world. 
Much of Dugan's language, along with Gumilyov's scientific vocabulary, in view of Vladimir Putin's pronouncements on Russia, the West, and the war on Ukraine. Dugan brings us back to where we began, to a proposed configuration of world power that is anti-national, but distinctly polar, where both universalism and nationalism are rejected in favor of great space polities, to a Eurasia that began as a critique of imperialism and ended up as an explicit incitement to reconstruct Russian empire. To conclude, our overview of how poles, blocks, worlds, and civilizations have appeared and disappeared over the course of history tells a nonlinear story about political imagination. We focus on political leaders and intellectuals and their efforts to describe and recommend conditions of affiliation and difference in conditions that they thought they knew. The ancients could, in some environments, imagine the universe under a single imperial ruler. But as spaces of the globe were drawn together, imperial and other rulers had to confront rival claimants for superior power. For a time in the 19th century, Europeans tried to regulate imperial rivalry among so-called civilized powers and to impose a code of conduct on each other. This attempt exploded in the imperial wars of the 20th century. Subsequently, the ultra-fragmentation of nation-state sovereignty appeared to take the place of the world of a few empires. But empire and nation-state contained elements of each other and were not the only options for political organization. We have looked at three distinctive proposals of transcontinental arrangements of power that emerged in the 20th century, at a time when intellectuals and activists drew multiple lines of connection and disconnection. Divides between the civilized and the uncivilized, the carve up of the world into several blocks, the two world and the three world model, claims for and fears of a unipolar and a multipolar world order have, have their histories and they remain conceptually active in the present. The three projects we described in our book were not the only ones, not the only proposals for reconfiguring spatial politics in the past and other forms of political imagination are active at present and will appear in the future. Thinking beyond the national political unit is not necessarily to think in a humane or inclusive fashion, quite the contrary. It is to make a normative claim that can be used to cement the power of a particular elite, national, multinational, supranational, or to try to tear it down. Vocabulary has its consequences. Claims to a great space, recognition or refusal of recognition of a people can justify murderous aggression. How we describe the relationship of people to bounded spaces in an interconnected world can influence access to resources that determine life chances. A critique of categories needs to be accompanied by analysis of the work categories do. For the historian, thinking about poles, blocks, worlds, and civilizations offers a relational view of the units of political action. We need not accept as givens national boundaries or the division of the world into ge geological continents that don't correspond to social realities. We don't have to resort to an amorphous globalism. Without falling for the fictions of the Russian world or any other imposed collectivity, we do want to explore the significance of the spatial differentiation of the world, including the possibilities and dangers of cross-continent connections. We want to think relationally and not just categorically, remembering that unequal relationships are still relationships. We end with a double question. Can we both understand how and why spatial configurations came to be what they are and develop better and more effective ideas for addressing the asymmetrical connections among the peoples of the world? And with that, we thank you for your attention and we look forward to your questions and comments.